Welcome back to chapter 13 of the Java EE course. We're going to get started with a new library called JSF. In this chapter, we'll be concentrating on just getting started with JSF. We'll implement a very simple page, which we'll be building up in future chapters into something more interesting. After a short discussion on what dynamic web pages are, we'll have a look at what JSF is and what it can do for us. And perhaps the most important concept in JSF is that of a page backing beam. A glamorous name for actually just a Java class. We'll see what it is and how it works. For me, the only hard thing about JSF at first is getting up and running. So I'll be helping you configure and deploy our JSF application. Well, we're now going to look at how to build dynamic web pages in Java EE. A dynamic web page, by the way, is one that is going to display data that changes over time. For example, I want to display a list of employees on a web page. Now, I can't write just regular HTML to do this because the page is going to change regularly. As new employees are added, the all employees page is going to need to be updated. There are lots of third party frameworks available to help us to do this in Java, like Struts, Wicket, Tapestry, and Stripes. But there are two libraries built into Java EE that we can use without downloading any external framework the servlet and JSP. APIs are both built into Java EE and have been available pretty much unchanged since the start of Java EE a decade ago. Now, servlets and JSPs are very simple ways of building dynamic web pages, but they are very low level libraries. You have got to do a lot of fiddly work to get anything useful up and running. Now, if you're interested in using servlets and JSPs, do check out our companion training course, Java Web Development, where we build a website from scratch using them. We won't study them here because it would take a long, long time to get anything useful up and running. On this course, I'm far more interested in JSF. Now, this has only been available since Java EE5. Although we can use the library outside of Java EE in a standalone fashion. Now it's called JSF, which stands for the uh, even less interesting phrase Java Server Faces. So, question one What is JSF? JSF is a library that will allow us to build dynamic pages at a higher level of abstraction. Let's say, for example, that my ultimate goal is to build a table on a web page, a dynamic table generated from a database. Instead of having to build low level HTML, JSF works using components. These components are just really HTML style tags that express at a high level what we want to appear on the web page. Here, I'm telling JSF I want to build a data table which consists of various columns which are somehow attaching to data in my server side system. And as well as data tables, JSF will give us charts and trees and various dynamic components. Now be careful, I'm only demonstrating roughly what JSF will look like on this caption. Please don't try to type this in just yet. It's not real JSF, it's just to get the idea across. As is often the case with Java technologies, there's a slight complexity about the versions of JSF. JSF 1 has been available since Java EE5. I'm afraid to say that 
in my opinion, it wasn't a very good framework at all. The implementations were buggy. It didn't report errors very clearly. And the specification was not really rich enough to make it easy to build decent web applications. It had some fans, and as always in Java, there was the usual tribal warfare about which was the best framework. But having seen JSF 1 used on a variety of projects, I can say that every single project that I work with absolutely hated it. But then JSF 2 came along in Java EE 6. That's the version we're working on on this course, and it is a vast improvement. I still think there are possibly some slightly better frameworks available, but JSF2 is right up there as a useful and practical framework. And the specification of this has been designed by a new team, and these guys are really competent people. So this course is going to cover JSF2. If you've been using Java EE6, as we've been doing throughout this course, then you're ready to go. But just a few words for anybody who's watching this and are working on an older version of GlassFish, GlassFish 1 or GlassFish 2, and you're still on Java EE5. Don't worry, you can still upgrade to JSF2 because JSF is just a pair of JAR files and you can use it on an older version of Java EE or you can even use it without. Java EE. But I'm assuming that you're running on GlassFish 3, which we supplied, which runs JSF2 out of the box. So as always, I'm going to begin with a very basic Hello World application to prove it works and to get a hold of some of the basic concepts. And then we'll build a form that allows us to enter new employees. And we'll integrate that with our existing code that we wrote in the first part of this course. So what I'm showing you here is a very simple web page that asks a user to enter their name. When they press a submit button, we're going to move to a second page that welcomes the user. Now, the first thing to notice about this code is that it is just a regular HTML page. Well, in fact, it's a little more than that. It's an XHTML page. Now that means that all of the tags in the page have to be properly closed. If you're working in just regular HTML, you can get away with using tags like P, say for a paragraph, and not bother have a closing P tag. But in XHTML, all of the tags must be so-called balanced. Every opening tag must have a closing tag. Now, I don't know how much HTML you've done before in the past. I'll assume that you've seen some HTML at some point. I'm sure if you struggle with any of the HTML, you'll be able to find easy reference pages on the web about it. But I'll try not to assume too much. Let's start from the top. The first tag is a normal HTML tag that we'd normally have on a web page but we do have to add on the XML namespace declaration. This tells your browser that you are using the official standard of XHTML. The following declaration is for JSF's purposes. We're going to use component libraries in our page, and this is how we declare them. There's a component library that ships with JSF straight out of the box that gives us all of the very basic components like labels and forms. The names of the component libraries in JSF are usually web URLs. And the idea behind that is that every single component library will have its own unique name. Your browser is not going to try and connect to the java.sun.com page. It's just really a label that identifies the standard JSF library. When we want to work with this library, we'll refer to this tag here, the H tag. We do this in JSF just because the basic components are really just replacements for the HTML components like forms and labels. 
This is only a fragment of a page. We'd usually have a header, as in regular HTML, but I can omit that, and I've gone straight onto the body. Notice that I'm not using the regular HTML body tag here. I'm using the JSF body tag, which I do by referring to H colon body. Now again, I could have actually used just body here, but when you go further with JSF and start to do more advanced techniques, that H colon body tag will prove really useful. So as described, I want to display an input field. And as with all web pages, to do this, I'm going to need a form. And again, I'm not going to use the basic HTML form. I'm going to use the JSF form using H colon form. Now that's going to give us a lot of benefits, as you'll see in a moment. It's important to remember that even when we're working with JSF, you can still use regular HTML elements. So here I'm using the H3 tag, a regular third level heading. And similarly, I can use a regular HTML label as well. However, I want to be able to take the data that has been entered into the input field and I want to somehow capture that in Java so that I can manipulate it. So this is where the first really interesting component comes into play and that's the input text component. This is a simple but quite powerful component in JSF. It will display an input field and when I submit the form, it will automatically take whatever's in that field and it will push it into a Java class. And that's a class that I'm going to write in a few moments time. So this value equals user.name probably won't mean much to you right now, but thinking a little ahead, this is going to find an object of type user and it's going to place the data into a property called name. You don't need to understand that fully just yet. As long as you get the general idea, I think we need to see the Java class that's going to hold the data before we really understand that field. And then we're going to place a button on the form. Now, if you've worked with regular HTML, you'll know this can be quite fiddly because we'd have to put a submit button and we would have to map it to an action and give the action a URL. Well, in JSF, we can simply use the command button component. And this is quite a clever component. It knows how to navigate from one page to the next. The key thing to notice is the action attribute here. The action is telling JSF which page to go to next. So on pressing this button, it's going to find a JSF page called Welcome. Well, I haven't written that page yet. That will come soon. But that's going to be the page that welcomes the user. Now we need to write some Java and we need to configure JSF, but I think I'll start by building this file in Eclipse. Well, this will be our first exploration of the web in Eclipse. I'm still working in the same projects as before, with my employee management system. But I've just closed all of the tabs for now because I don't want any of my EJB code to be getting in my way when I'm building web pages. As I think I've already mentioned, I'm working a little in the dark with you. I don't know how much uh, prior web development, if any, you've done before. So I've tried to simplify things with the code that I've given you. I know we don't really want to look at the build.xml file. This is the ant script, but I just want you to take a look at this line here. I've added into that build script a folder name called web content. And my idea there is that we're going to create a folder called web content and it must exactly match that string, including the casing, capital W, capital C. And what will happen is when we run this build script, just going a little further down, now don't panic if you don't know Ant, the general idea is this configuration here is going to gather together 
everything that we have in our project and it's going to build a single file called a war file. Again, we've covered that in a separate course, the Java web development course. If you haven't heard of a war file, it's a web archive. And Glassfish will recognize that as all of the code we need for an entire website. So this bit of config is going to build that war file and notice that right here, it references the HTML variable that I declared at the top here. In fact, that's just a pointer to our web content folder. Well, if you didn't follow that, what I mean is you now need to right click on your project, select new folder, and then create a folder called web content with exactly the correct casing. And all of our HTML, XHTML, and JSF files are going to go into that folder. So I hope you're okay with that. And then I'm going to right click, select new, and select file. Now, again, I, I have a slight problem here. I always design my courses to be usable on any development environment that you choose. So I'm working here with the most basic Eclipse installation I can find. There are in existence plenty of Eclipse plugins that will allow you to build XHTML files in a really simple way. And there are also some JSF plugins as well that will give you things like that awful copy and paste code at the top of the file. But I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to work from a very basic editor. I'm going to type everything in longhand so that you understand exactly what's happening. And if you want to use plugins, then feel free. So I'm writing here my initial page, which was the hello.xhtml page. And this is going to be rather tedious. I'm going to have to type in all of those namespaces by hand. Now, if you find typing awkward, feel free to look in the sample code folder for this chapter and you'll find complete versions of all of these files. And I need to enter into here the standard XHTML namespace. So this is XML NS equals HTTP and the URL to enter here is www.w3.org forward slash 1999. That's the year they invented the standard, I think, forward slash XHTML. I don't know if you're impressed that I remember that off the top of my head. Well, in fact, I didn't. I was cribbing off my own caption here. Or alternatively, if you were to Google for XHTML namespace, the first hit here is exactly that URL. And you can see there that this is the definition of that namespace and you can copy from there. The next part is perhaps more important. This is XML NS colon H. This is where I'm telling JSF where to find its component libraries. And this one is java.sun.com.com rather forward slash JSF forward slash HTML. Well, that's a very unpleasant thing to have to do. And you'll always want to be able to copy and paste that in. From here on in, it's not too bad. We declared a body of our document using the H colon tags as described in the on the caption. And we're looking to ask the user to enter your name as our label asking for the name. And now for the important one, this is our first serious JSF component. The input text component will render a normal HTML input field, but we also have the ability to take the input here and to automatically push it into a Java object. Very valuable. We just need to specify value equals, and I promise I will be explaining what's going on in here as we go a little further forward with the example. But we need the symbol here, followed by user.name. 
And then to enable the form to be submitted, we need a command button, as it's called in JSF. This will be a normal form button, but has the ability to know how to find the next page in the sequence. The value is just the string to output on the page. Go to the welcome page. And action is the name of the JSF page that we want to move on to. Well, we haven't written that yet, but we will. And as always, I've forgotten to include the h colon form tag, which I'm going to wrap around all of these elements. It would be a big mistake to forget the form tag, although we would get an error if we had forgotten it. So that's our first JSF page. Notice that the JSF page actually has an XHTML extension. This gives me a chance to mention a little bit of history before we move on to another caption. And the history is that in the earlier version of JSF, we had to write JSP pages. You might be familiar with JSP from the basic part of the web standard. Now, it's a long story, but there were lots of problems with JSP, which is why in JSF2, they've now moved to a new standard, which enables us to use this far simpler, far more flexible format of XHTML. And you might hear the term facelets referred to. Now, that's a term that just means the ability to use XHTML in our JSF. So we've made a start, still quite a lot to do. Let's get back to a caption. Now, our user is going to be entering data into the form on the browser. And one of JSF's main features is it can automatically transfer the data from a form into a Java object. I'm going to call this object, or I should say the class I've defined for the object, I'm going to call it a page backing bean. There are other names for this in JSF. You might hear it called the backing bean, sometimes the managed bean. But I prefer the term page backing bean because I think it's the most accurate term for it. It's really a simple plain Java class with an attribute for the name field on the form. And we also have a get and a set method pair for that attribute. Now, these are required because JSF is going to be passing data into the set method from the form. And it will also later on extract data back out of the object through the get method. Now, this object is going to be managed automatically by JSF. We will never manually create an instance of this class. So we need to use the managed bean annotation. And this means that the class is going to be managed by JSF. That means that JSF is going to create instances of this class and populate them. The value here in the name attributes corresponds to the name that we used on the JSF page. Let's just go back to our JSF code that we wrote a few moments ago. Now notice here, I'm asking JSF to store the value entered by the user into the page backing bean called user. That's how it finds the object. This label here, corresponds with the name specified here. And similarly, going back, the property referenced here, name corresponds with the get name and set name method pair. The page backing bean is one of the most important aspects of JSF, and it's how data is transferred from our Java into the components. Well, that doesn't look too difficult. It's going to be a new Java class. And I think really the, the only decision to make is the package in which this backing bean should live. Here are our existing packages from the other tiers in our architecture. And the only advice I can give really is that backing beans are 
very tied into JSF. They're specific to JSF and therefore they need their own package. So I'm going to put mine in a package called com.virtualpairprogrammers.backingbeans. You can choose anything you like as long as you have a, a, a special package devoted just to your backing beans. We called this one user bean. You'll find on most JSF projects, they suffix the word bean onto the end of every backing bean class. You don't have to by any means and very easy to create. We just need the attribute to hold the data from the page and we can even generate the get set pair in Eclipse using the source menu, generate getters and setters. I'll tick the name attribute, click OK, and the job is done. The only thing we mustn't forget is to add the managed bean annotation and the name we're going to give in the form is user. Now we have just one problem here. Of course, I need to import the managed bean annotation, but I'm pressing Control Shift and O here, and I'm not getting any imports added. And that's because we don't currently have a reference to the JSF jar files. If I go to my project properties menu and select Java build path. It's a long, long time ago now that in the very early stages of the course, we added some external jars, mostly beginning with Java X. We picked those up from the Glassfish modules directory. Well, I advised you back then to use just the Java X jar files and to add them all in, but the JSF jar files begin JSF instead. So we're going to have to do some work to add those jar files in. We'll add external jars and well, Eclipse has actually remembered the folder that I used before, but I'll start from the beginning. I have Glassfish installed on my C drive. Yours may be different. Then there's another Glassfish folder. Then we're following modules and you should find, there's a long, long list of them there, but you should find JSF API dot jar. There is an impl jar file as well, but that's the implementation of JSF and we only actually need that on the server. So we're going to select just JSF API dot jar. Now it's in the list. And if we click OK, I can now do control shift and O and that's good news. All of the JSF classes are stored in the Java X dot faces package. Now going back to our original JSF page, remember that we'll be seeing a button on the page and when the user clicks the button, the action that's being performed is this action that we've defined called welcome. Now for now, what this means is that JSF will navigate to a page called welcome.xhtml. So let's have a look at what that page will look like. Well, once again, it's a regular xhtml page. We have the tedium of the HTML tag at the top, and I'm keeping this page very simple. We're just going to welcome the user. The most important aspect of this page is that we're able to read the values inside the page backing bean by referring to the bean name, user, and the property that we want to access. So this is a really simple example to get us started, but we can now see how it's possible to transfer data that a user's entered on one page to be preserved and appear on another page. So I'll start by copying the header from my existing hello XML page. And I'm creating a new file here in web contents called welcome XHTML. I'll still need the hbody tag around the bulk of my page. And as a placeholder, we're going to have a header one tag and we're going to welcome the user. By the way, I didn't mention this symbol here. 
because it seems to have a different name in different countries. Apparently its official name is the number sign and it looks like that. I'm just being a little circumspect here because I know in the United States you'll be calling it the pound sign. If you're in Canada it will be the number sign key. Here in the UK we call it the hash symbol and there's a few other names for it as well. I think I've also heard it called the gate symbol as well. Uh, but anyway, that's what we always use in JSF to refer to an object. So here I'm saying the object that we've called user, I want to extract the name and output that on the page. And that's pretty much all we need for our first JSF application. So we're now ready to build the system. And because we're building a web application for the first time, we need to make a few changes. So far, we've just been building a single jar file, which has contained all of our Java. A jar file is a Java archive. But when building a web application in Java, we need to create a WAR file. I think I mentioned those a short while ago. For full details, either check on the web or our web development training course, but you really don't need to know much about them other than they are zipped files in a very similar format to jar files, but they're intended to store web pages and all of the associated Java with those web pages. I've taken the liberty in our build script of already creating the process to create that WAR file. But the key change we need to make for this chapter is look for the target name equals build all. And I need you to add to the end of the list war. And this will invoke the process that I've defined to create a war file. When we rerun our build using the same process as we've been, you'll see now that there's an extra step to the build process right here. And we're looking for building war. And the name that I've given the war file in the script is webapp.war. If you want to change that, you can change that in the XML file. So I hope you're seeing a clean build complete and build successful. If you have a problem there, check the ant script, check that all of your code is compiling. And if you don't get any further than this, do give us a contact and we'll help you get going again because that's quite important. We've now built our first web application. If you're curious about WAR files, you can navigate to your workspace folder, have a look in the project and in the distribution directory, you can open the WAR file using any zip editor. I happen to have one installed on my machine called WinRAR. Maybe you're working on something like Windows XP, or Windows 7 or Vista, which won't recognize the WAR extension. You could just rename it to .zip just to have a little look inside it. If you do that, don't forget to rename it back or, or we'll lose sight of it. But if you have a little poke around in there, you'll see that the general structure is our HTML files are at the root. And then if we go into this webinf directory, you'll see under classes, all of our Java code is in there that we wrote earlier. So a WAR file is more than just web pages, it's web pages and Java. Anyway, we're not really here for those low level concepts. So I'll uh, let you investigate WAR files if you're interested. For this course, it's enough to know that we can pass that WAR file across to Glassfish to make our application be live. As always, make sure Glassfish is running and then visit the admin console at localhost 4848 and follow the link to applications. And you'll recall that earlier on in the course, we built a set of EJBs and deployed them to Eclipse. And you can see that application here. Now, a complication here and a very important one is that we want to deploy our web archive. But remember that our web archive contains everything in our workspace, including the EJBs that we wrote earlier. 
Now, only if we're on Java EE6 and above, it is absolutely fine to deploy a WAR file that contains EJBs as well as the web content. In earlier versions, we would have to be careful to build a WAR file with just the web pages and the backing beams and a separate JAR file with the EJBs in. That was really painful, but now life is much easier. We just need the single WAR file. But, and this is crucial, we are going to have to be careful to undeploy the JAR file that we had before. Otherwise, when we deploy the WAR file, there will be a clash because Glassfish will not allow two versions of the same EJBs to be deployed at the same time. So follow these instructions really carefully or it will lead to terrible problems. We'll click the existing application and click undeploy and OK. So now that's gone. We'll click deploy and choose file. And now we'll just select the web app. We don't need the jar file anymore. That's a subset of our full application. Now I think everything else on this page will be automatically filled in. The context route is going to appear in the URL for our web application. So remember the string that's in there. I'm not going to change it. I'm going to leave it as web app. Application name is just a friendly name for our application. Very similar to the one that we had before when we deployed the EJB. And I'm going to just add in there employee management. That will just appear on the next screen. I'm going to click OK. And I'm really looking here for a clean screen like the one you can see here. If you have an error at this stage, please go back and check everything carefully. And if you need to redeploy and you've had an error, I would recommend you undeploy everything here first so you have a blank screen again and then go through the deploy process. If you get really stuck, drop us a contact. This is important that we that we get this right here. If you have a look on this list here, it's telling us that we've just deployed some EJBs that are using JPA and using the web as well. So it's quite a big deployment that we've just done. So this application is now live and we're now free to visit it. So I've just popped open a new browser here and the URL we need to visit is localhost colon 8080. This is the port that Glassfish uses for you to test your web applications. Then you need to add in the context root. That was the field that Glassfish automatically filled in before. And it's a subfolder in which you're storing your entire application. And then after that, we can navigate to our page. Now remember that our page is called hello.xhtml. Let's have a look at what that looks like. Now I hope you've got this far. If you have a HTTP 404 error here, check the URL very carefully that you've entered here. Check the name of the file you created and check that your context roots back in Glassfish, and that's the value you can see here, is correct. But you might realize that this page isn't really as we'd expected it. We expected to have an input field and a button appearing here. Now that's because if we look at the source of this page, view page source, well, that's exactly what we typed in in Eclipse. But input text and command button are not HTML. Our browser here does not recognize those tags at all. If you need to make JSF work, you need to change the URL slightly. I'm going to ask you to change the .xhtml to be .jsf instead. And I'll hit return there. And now you can see the page is appearing as expected. I'll explain in a moment why 
changing to JSF has worked and where that extension has come from. But before then, I think it would be worth testing our exciting new application. Let's enter a name into there and click on go to the welcome page. And wonderful, our first very simple, but nonetheless functional JSF application. Before I explain about where the JSF extension came from, I just want to draw your attention to one problem that does tend to upset anybody that is new to JSF. I'm going to go back into Eclipse. Now, assume that I've made some changes to the code or to the web pages. You can probably guess the process. It's exactly the same as with EJBs. I've just rerun the build and then back in Glassfish, I'm going to redeploy and then select the war file and then click on OK. So exactly the same process as with EJBs and we're looking for no errors appearing on this screen. But now we're going to go across to our web page and it's very, very tempting here to want to press the refresh button. That would be a very, very natural thing to do. Now, the first thing is that you're going to get a warning in your browser saying, are you sure you want to refresh this page? Now, that's for a reason which I'm not going to explore on this course. If you do want to research this any further, the clue is this is because all forms in JSF by default are posted. You can change that default, but we'd have to go a little further before we could do that. So it's okay to press continue, but we're going to get a rather unpleasant looking error. Now, please don't panic about this error. JSF is essentially saying to us here that, I'm sorry, you've tried to redisplay the page which was welcoming this Alan Jones, but the Alan Jones data was on a previous deployment and has now been wiped on the system. Even though you think you're just refreshing the original page you came from. Now, as I say, when you get more advanced with JSF, you'll learn all about various strategies to get around this problem. But my advice to you would be the best way of refreshing a page when you've done a redeployment is to highlight the address bar and this will work in Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome, as I'm on here, and then hit the Enter key. And that's forcing your browser to do a completely new, clean request with no stale data inside. And then we can go right on ahead and rerun our use case successfully. All right, so where did that JSF file name come from in the browser? Well, the process isn't magic. All that is happening is the standard web.xml file, which I supplied to you. That's always been part of your workspace. I didn't mention it before. It's part of the basic Java web standard, and its job is to configure so-called servlets. I don't know if you've met them before. They're Java classes that can be associated with URLs. And what we have in JSF is a servlet called basis servlet, which is driving the whole business logic of our application. Now, if you don't know about servlets and the web.xml file, this is something else that we cover in the Java web development training course. But again, you really don't need to know too much detail about this file. It's just a standard file which Glassfish is consulting and this is the key tag here, the servlet mapping. This is telling Glassfish that any URL ending in .jsf needs to run the JSF logic. And in a nutshell, the JSF logic is to run any backing bean methods and then find a matching page for the URL you've typed in. So when we typed in hello.jsf that told JSF to run its logic, which in our case was the creation of a backing bean, and then it searched for a page called hello.xhtml. 
it's perhaps the most confusing aspect of JSF because we never wrote a file called hello.jsf. There is no file ending in .jsf anywhere in our workspace. The file, as you'll recall, was called hello.xhtml, but you will find on projects that people do refer to this as being the JSF page. If you wanted to, in web.xml, you could change this extension to anything you like. However, I recommend you keep it as JSF so you know exactly what's happening. Well, I promised it would only be a simple application and that's what we have. Clearly we need to go further with this and over the next two chapters, we'll be building and expanding on this very basic system. But so far, we've seen that in JSF, we write XHTML pages. Sometimes these are called facelets, but that's something of a historic term. The XHTML is almost regular XHTML with the addition of components. The way that we get data in and out of the components is via a page backing bean. And at the moment, that backing bean is just a regular Java class with an annotation on top. We'll be expanding that quite a lot in the next two chapters. Once we've deployed the JSF application, the next confusion is that the page that we visit had the extension of .jsf, even though we never wrote a page with that extension. This is because the page name invokes logic on the server. That logic is going to run any behavior that we've defined, and then it will find a matching page with the XHTML extension. Well, the one thing we haven't done so far is do any interesting behavior. We're just going from one page to another at the moment. So in the next chapter, we're going to look at how JSF works with behavior. We'll be able to run some interesting business logic. Join me again for that.